supply with your connector at the bottom. You've got basically your whole recording microphone already ported. So that would be that one. The next one, which also didn't get up here very well, is called the Shure NT, or excuse me, KSM 141. And why I kind of brought that one out is that it has the ability to do multiple patterns. So if you're in a situation where you're like, wow, I'd like to do uh, ORTF with cardio or XY, I can just turn the mic to cardio and I've got it. Or you're like, you know, I've got a, a really nice sounding room, I have a choir, let's do a pair of omnis. I can switch those to omnidirectional, put them on stands, and I've got it. And one thing about Shure microphones in general is they're extremely reliable and they're well built and you can almost always get service for them. So that's not a, not a bad thing to have. Now for people that are looking for a little higher end mic that want to make an investment, I mean if the Beatles use Neumann, then we can use Neumann. Now these mics, uh, the KM183, 184, one's the cardioid, which is the KM184, and the Omni is the 183. Okay, so now we've got a little bit of the basics. We know about the patterns, we know about the different elements of the operating procedure. Where do I put the mic? One of the fallacies I think that I like to break with people is that microphones do not hear like our ears. I, I think there's a general consensus. It's like, you know, I stand here and this is what I hear, so that's where I'm going to put the mic. Well, the microphone doesn't have a brain behind it. When we're listening to things, we're hearing or we're, you know, basically ignoring things or not, you know, things that a microphone just doesn't have the ability to hear. I would say the majority of the time when someone says, this is the spot I want to have my mics, they're probably too far away. Um, you know, let's say we had an ensemble that was up here, standing right here, or, or sitting right here, and somebody was in the fourth row, and I'm like, yeah, it sounds great back there, it's, that's the balance, and I'd say, that's the balance for you, but that's not the balance for the microphone. So, a good starting point, now this is just starting, and I want to give you one to uh, walk away and say, this is where the mic has to be, but in general, if you start between four and five feet back from a, a large ensemble and you're about 10 to 11 feet up, let's say with that road mic, you're gonna get something that's presentable. It's a good starting point. I'm not saying that's gonna be it, because a lot of times in sound checks we move closer or we pull back. You know, as you well know, the orchestra just recently came back and started playing. So I was in the hall a week ago. Now, with the new stage floor, new house floor, all new seats, even though I've worked in there for a long time, I put my mics back where I thought they should be. I moved them three times because they changed the room. And it's not that it was inherently different, but it was enough that I'm like, you know, I don't want to be that close. I can hear that things are not, I'm not hearing the sound of the room like I heard before. So I just started moving them back a little bit. And if you have time to do that, you know, move it six inches, maybe move it a foot. You know, and then eventually you'll kind of say, okay, that's, that sounds right. You know, the biggest thing is to try to get a good balance between the front of the ensemble and the back. And one thing I found is as you go higher, you tend to hear more of the back of the ensemble. As you come get lower, you tend to hear more of the front. It's, it's kind of a general principle. Okay, now I've got the microphones placed. What do I record them into? Well, you know, when I started in this business, if you wanted to make a classical recording of any professional quality, you had to do it on those big open room machines. But that was really the only system that was available. They were starting to introduce some digital things, but it really wasn't very prevalent. I was fortunate that our company invested in these small machines. You've probably seen one of the James Bond movies, uh, Nagra, and you could put these extra connector on it and make these things. And they were relatively portable. You didn't have to take out the big studio machines. Well, you know, 30 years later, we finally have, you know, have a much more compact solution. And probably the one that most people have used or seen, which is the Zoom. The Zoom price-wise, and for other reasons, it's really probably the best bang for the buck out there. You've got an SD card in there, you've got two microphones, it even has a mount on the bottom that you can put it on, on a stand to get it up. 
only limitation is, is that if you use the microphones that are built in and use it as it is, it probably won't be as high quality as you're expecting. I mean, it's the old get what you pay for thing. $250 is not going to get you the same quality microphone as sounding as a more expensive one. This other one, I've not used this one personally, but I've heard some really good things about it, so I'm just showing it as a possibility. The nice thing about that is that you can change the patterns on those microphones. Now, if you have a good budget, this is the, the recorder that we use for our location recording. This one records to flash. We have one that records to hard drives, but basically the same. All the, I would say, majority of the people that do sound for film and for television on location, they use sound mics. They build a whole range of recorders and amplifiers and the whole works. So now we've got a system for recording it in. We've got a, now what do we do? Well, like most things, like if you take pictures of your kids or you do video or whatever, you need to be able to edit it. Do something with it than just leave it in, in the camera for, forever, right? This one, Audacity, is probably the most widely used free piece of software for digital editing. Um, I would say that half of the news reporters around the world that don't have any resources are probably using that. But it's probably not the most intuitive. I've played with it a little bit, and you can get around it, but it's not something you can sit down in five minutes and go, oh yeah, I know how to use this instantly. But it's definitely available. I'm not going to say it's not good, but it's just what it is. Pro Tools. Now, anytime you get out on the, the net and you start searching around for different software, almost invariably Pro Tools will probably come up. It was a system designed back in the late 80s, and it's just been evolving ever since. Our company is invested heavily in Pro Tools. And one of the things that they really understand is that they can, you can start on a low budget system and it will, you can bring it all the way up to you know, thousands of dollar systems. And they have these, what they call the interfaces. So let's say you're saying, you know, I don't want to buy a little tape machine. I don't want to buy a, you know, any of that. I just want to record it to my computer. This is one way you can do it. Both of these devices basically have the ability to plug microphones in, you plug it into your laptop, you record it into your computer, and then you can be editing right away. The only limitation about something like, you know, when you're dealing with that, is that it's not quite as portable as just being able to plop it on top of a mic stand in the next room. You're gonna have to carry a little the microphones and the connectors and, you know, the you know, computer things. But inherently, especially the one that's the M-Box, the, the microphone amplifiers in there are very good quality. So here's the next step. Everyone seems to want to record everything onto their iPad or their iPhone. It's getting to the point now that with the size of the, look at the, look at the 64 gigabyte uh, iPhone or the iPad, you can record hours on there. So basically, a company by the name of Apogee developed this little duet, which basically interfaces right with their iPad. This is a piece of hardware and it's not the software. So the next part of that is RNA. Now, I've not used this one personally. Uh, 